Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Generous Futures Anti-Semitism Online. My name is Elise Weiskopf, and I am the director of the Hillel Office at Toronto Metropolitan University. We are very excited about this panel today, and we can't wait to dive into the discussion. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. I am so delighted to be moderating this Generous Futures panel during Canadian Jewish Heritage Month. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our lead sponsor of this series, TD Bank Group, for helping to advance these very important discussions. TD Bank Group has been a great supporter of our university, and we are delighted that they have joined us on this journey of understanding. Please note that live captioning is available during this webinar. Please click the caption button on the bottom of your screen to turn them on. Today, we are focusing on how anti-Semitism is perpetrated online and how digital platforms have led to a devastating uprise of anti-Semitism in Canada and globally. We're going to tackle questions such as, why have social media platforms failed to act on 84% of anti-Semitic posts? How can we ensure our digital platforms are safe and free from anti-Semitic hate speech and conspiracy theories? And how can digital platforms be used to confront and create awareness around anti-Semitism? There are many resources available online that provide more information about anti-Semitism and how you can take action to stop it. We will share some resources with you in an email following this event. I will pose questions to the panel and following this time permitting, I will ask our panelists to respond to several questions that were submitted by the audience upon registration. I am now delighted to introduce you to our panel of leaders. Emily Thompson is the Associate Director of the Simon Wiesenthal Center um, Research Department based in LA. Her research focuses on digital terrorism and hate project exploring how extremists utilize the internet and social media to spread hate and harmful content and ideologies. Emily is the program director for Combat Hate, an interactive student workshop designed to introduce media literacy skills and provide tools for young people to deal with hate online. Welcome, Emily. Daniel Penaton man manages the online hate research and education project at the Sarah and Heim Neuberger Holocaust Education Center in Toronto. He is a heritage professional, curator, and cultural consultant with broad experience who sits on the board of the Toronto War Museum. His work has appeared in outlets like the Globe and Mail, the Walrus, TVO, and the Literary Review of Canada. And he's also consulted on a range of nonprofit and for-profit cultural endeavors by both small and large organizations. Welcome, Daniel. And lastly, Noah is the vice president for, GT, for the GTA at the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs. With more than a decade of experience working in government relations, political research and communications, Noah has testified as an expert witness at all levels of government and represented CJA as a spokesperson on local and national media. Prior to joining CJA, Noah worked at the Canada-Israel Committee and the Washington-based Middle East Institute. Noah currently serves on the board of JVS Toronto and is the chair of the organization's advocacy committee. Welcome, Noah. And unfortunately, Professor Erwin Kotler was unable to join us for the discussion today but we look forward to jumping in with, um, with our three panelists here today. So I'm going to start by asking each of you um, the same question and you have about a minute to answer. And this is how we'll open. 
So Emily, perhaps we could start with you and then move on to Daniel and then Noah. So we'll start broadly. Why is this a relevant topic to discuss now? Thanks. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for having uh, me as part of this discussion today. Uh, I think this is a really important question. I'm always very grateful when this issue is being brought to the attention of a, a wider audience, because unfortunately, we know anti-Semitism is nothing new. It's described as the oldest hatred, and it tends to manifest in new ways with every generation that comes, hence why this online component makes it particularly relevant right now. Uh, the Wiesenthal Center has been tracking the use of digital platforms since the 1980s, so before the creation of the internet as we know it today, to spread anti-Semitism and other types of hate. But the difference being now that access to this content is, is mainstream. Everyone has access to a smartphone, a tablet, a computer, a games with soul, or all of those, right? Uh, and so this problem is really growing exponentially, and we see it manifesting more and more virulently every year with an increasing number of attacks perpetrated against Jewish people in real life that are fueled by this online activity. We know that social media is a very powerful tool for marketing, for raising money, recruitment, uh, deepening personal connections and relationships, and it also spawned its own conspiracies like QAnon and revitalized ancient hatreds uh, like blood libel. Holocaust denial and this hero worship of, of evildoers. And so during the COVID-19 pandemic, when everyone had to utilize social media as a kind of lifeline for communication, uh, this really exacerbated an already complex situation. Uh, finally, the advent of social media also means that incidents that maybe were once local uh, feel global and incidents that are global now also feel very local. So uh, there's certainly much to discuss. Thank you so much, Emily. Daniel, let's turn to you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. Uh, so we should be discussing anti-Semitism right now because when we look at the hate crime data here in Canada, we can see that the Jewish community is facing surging violence and intolerance, which should itself be reason enough to address the problem. However, uh, this is also an issue that affects us all. Anti-Semitism is inherently conspiratorial, and we are living in conspiratorial times. According to Elections Canada, as many as 40% of Canadians are thinking conspiratorially, which is a mindset that is particularly vulnerable to anti-Semitic ideas. The white genocide conspiracy theory, which holds Jews to be responsible for a genocide of white people through several mechanisms, has produced attacks on Jewish, Black, Muslim, Hispanic, and progressive communities. In the last 11 years, attacks motivated by the white genocide conspiracy theory, which spreads primarily online, have killed nearly 200 people in Canada, New Zealand, the US, and Norway, to name a few. Conspiratorial anti-Semitism that inspires violence isn't limited to white genocide. Just look at the synagogue in Texas, where just this January, several congregants and a rabbi were taken hostage by an armed individual who was under the impression that Jews could release impris uh, imprisoned members of Al-Qaeda, or the libels accusing Israel of creating the COVID virus that are currently informing the international surge of violence against Jewish communities that we're witnessing. So it's essential that we address this multifaceted issue because it's one that affects us all. Thank you so much, Daniel. And Noah, please go ahead. So to build off what Emily and, and Daniel have already said, and, uh, online anti-Semitism isn't a new phenomenon. It's something we've been advocating for action against uh, for more than a decade, uh, but it's becoming a problem of increasing urgency. Um, both of my colleagues on the panel have spoken about how online hate doesn't just stay online, it's increasingly manifesting in real world violence. That's a serious concern. And unfortunately, we have far too many examples over the last year where it's taken lives. Uh, and we're seeing an exponential exposure to online hate that has been around and evolving for more than a decade. Uh, with everybody's shift online during COVID-19. If my 91-year-old grandmother is using Zoom to speak to my brother and I, uh, you can imagine the culture shift that's happened in our society with people living their lives in the online space to a degree uh, that, that was inconceivable beforehand. And so the online hate that's always existed and festered there is having an exponential impact today. Um, and finally, um, the extent to which um, uh, online hate recruitment is taking root uh, among children and youth is something that is 
deeply concerning. Uh, to give a couple of examples, we've seen um, a dance meme uh, on a popular social media uh, platform uh, that ultimately encouraged a number of middle school students to come into a Toronto school and do a dance that involved Hitler salutes. And they didn't know what they were doing, but this was a gateway, an entry point into the world of white supremacist recruitment. And you know, if you look at the um, synagogue shooter in San Diego, this was a university student, well-liked, um, uh, good grades, uh, lots of extracurriculars, somebody who didn't fit the profile that you would think of as, as a, a, a mass murderer or an attempted mass murderer. And after spending 18 months uh, getting sucked into this online content, he ended up setting fire to a mosque and uh, bringing a gun to a synagogue. And so I think um, we have a lot of these stark examples uh, currently, presently, in the here and now uh, that make this conversation really important. Thank you so much, Noah. And thank you to Daniel and Emily for um, starting us off. So we're going to now move into some um, tailor specific questions that were um, that we have been crafted for each of you to answer uh, based on some of your expertise. So um, Emily, we'll start with you. So can you please tell us a little bit about how anti-Semitism is being spread online? And perhaps you could share some examples with us. Certainly, uh, this could probably be the topic of a several day long uh, webinar, so I'll, I'll try and keep it to some kind of key examples. Uh, obviously, as we've all said, this spread of anti-Semitism online has really evolved significantly since the internet began in the 1990s. Uh, once what we could consider to be the sort of property of a fringe community, anti-Semitism has seeped into mainstream discourse and platforms, and like Noah was saying, increasingly across spaces inhabited by young people. I think commonly when most people think of uh, social media, we think of the major platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And whilst it's certainly true, we see many anti-Semitic sentiments and beliefs being shared there, the, the space, uh, the scope of spaces where these ideas can be shared online, the number of platforms that exist is absolutely vast. And the challenge is even graver there where online moderation is not as vigilant or even non-existent and these ideas diffuse more readily. I think one of the greatest challenges we face, especially when we're looking at the spread of this content to young people, is that a lot of anti-Semitic rhetoric can be guised in this so-called dark humour, in memes, in jokes, and it gives a kind of veneer of deniability for those who create and share it. And unfortunately, we see that has this impact of desensitising audiences to this type of hateful rhetoric. We know that this problem has grown within the scope of video gaming, video games like Roblox, associated messaging platforms like Discord and Steam. They've all been exploited to spread anti-Semitism. Uh, on my own research onto Roblox, I've seen replicas of Auschwitz-Birkenau uh, and an Israeli school shooting uh, scenario. And so while this kind of revelation of extremism in the gaming world isn't necessarily new, it's something that they've grappled with for a long time, the real live, real time live chat and audio component and the huge access to games and consoles has meant that this space has really exploded in popularity and so therefore have problems. Uh, as Noah mentioned also, TikTok, uh, the hot topic of the past two years, is another space where we see expressions of anti-Semitism. We see videos promoting neo-Nazism, glorifying mass shooters, spreading stereotypes and the conspiracy theories that Daniel was talking about. They're all accessible there. And the problem with TikTok is that it has a very powerful algorithm which pushes users further down this rabbit hole. So if you start watching, liking and friending people who create this type of content, TikTok's going to offer you similar suggestions to keep you on their platform. From the far right perspective, we look at uh, a space called Telegram, a so-called encrypted messaging app with a user base of over 400 million people. Uh, it's a hotbed for far right extremists and Jew haters to come together to network, to communicate, to share files, and again, to glorify those individuals who have gone before them in attacking uh, individuals from minority groups. We also see the exploitation of, of kind of random video chat platforms, places like Omegle, 
uh, which have been utilized by individuals who dress as Nazis and target Jewish and other minority groups with hate speech on that platform. And often they come from the under 18 audience. They record the reactions of those users and then they post them online for a, for a wider audience to see and again, kind of re-victimize them. And then finally, if we take the case of the Buffalo shooting in uh, New York just a couple of weeks ago, the perpetrator chose to post their manifesto to 4chan, which is a largely unmoderated online forum, and to live stream their attack online on a gaming uh, themed website, Twitch, which follows a trend of other extremists who have gone on to commit hate motivated murders against minority populations. We know in the attack, the Buffalo perpetrator targeted the black community. But if you look at the manifesto, uh, he was also virulently anti Semitic. And the videos and manifestos from these incidents recirculate over and over again. They're celebrated. It re-victimizes the victims over and over again and unfortunately has the impact of encouraging others to follow suit. So that's just a, a few examples from our digital terrorism and hate uh, project. Unfortunately, many more I could mention. Thank you, Emily, for sharing. It's quite scary when you really hear and you go down the list of all the different platforms, it's, it seems like it's just never ending. So thank you for shedding some light on that. Um, Daniel, um, could you please um, help us um, answer this question? How does online hate transcend the screen and impact real world interactions? Uh, so I'll use as a jumping off point, uh, the Buffalo shooting that was just mentioned and the white genocide conspiracy theory that I mentioned in the introduction. Uh, basically, um, when neo-Nazis were marching in Charlottesville and they're chanting that Jews will not replace us, this was a real life manifestation of rhetoric that was being kicked around online. It's a very old anti-Semitic conspiracy theory among extreme facets um, that have been traded in backroom publications, on shortwave radio, on uh, early message boards, and today, as uh, Emily mentioned, are being traded on websites like 4chan. And unfortunately, we've seen them distill through into uh, real world action. So I wanted to focus on a few specific examples, um, particularly the individual who killed 11 people and injured six, including several Holocaust survivors at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, targeted the site because the congregation was involved with assisting refugees. So this is a key component of the white genocide conspiracy theory, the belief that Jews through a variety of mechanisms, including bringing in non-white migrants are eliminating white people. We know that uh, through analysis of the shooter's social media footprint, um, we know that this was an individual who was radicalized into white supremacist beliefs, primarily on fringe websites. And uh, this belief was at the core of his, um, of his radicalization, if you will. Uh, he was well-connected with other figures in the online far white, on far right and was actively posting about his views about the replacement in the lead up to the attack. So this is an example of someone who is clearly radicalizing almost by themselves, but in situ of a network and which resulted in real world terror. I should also mention the attacks in Christchurch, New Zealand and more recently in Buffalo, as they were motivated by white genocide conspiracy theories that uh, were first encountered online, often in hyper irony poisoned environments. Both shooters released manifestos that were absolutely littered with irony poisoned internet culture and misdirection, which were then easily found and widely discussed online. The Buffalo shooter explicitly referenced the Christchurch, uh, Christchurch shooter's inspiration, and the Christchurch shooter had mentioned the um, Norway uh, shooter as inspiration, which shows how online and offline speech actions can often reinforce each other and drive further action. Today, about a third of Americans believe in elements of the white genocide conspiracy. And in 2019, around 37% of Canadians uh, told the poll that they think of immigration as a threat to white people. Uh, several mainstream politicians in North America and Europe have explicitly or implicitly endorsed the theory, and it's being regularly spread by broadcasters with massive viewership. So whether these people realize it or not, they are playing with inherently anti-Semitic ideas, which are destructive not only to the Jewish community, but to multicultural democracy itself. And we're seeing it result both in uh, the very extreme examples of shootings, but also in a much more generalized creep from online screens into everyday political beliefs. Uh, this is, a, of course, not limited to the Jewish community. We know that conspiracy theories about um, the origin of the COVID virus have led to hate crimes and violent assaults against Asian communities uh, around the world. And uh, we know that conflict um, in Israel between, uh, in Israel, 
when people in North America interact with that news, it's often online, often through a screen, filtered through misinformation, disinformation, or framed in an inflammatory way. And as a result, we know that Jewish communities recently have reported feeling very unsafe as a result of upticks of activity and violence in response to that. So those are all just examples of how things can kind of leach through from the online sphere because the the di dividing membrane is not as thick as we might think it is. Thank you, Daniel. Really insightful. Thank you so much. And Noah, we're going to just um, shift gears slightly. So how does the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition or the IRA definition of anti-Semitism apply to an online environment? And what are some of the challenges? So um, the IRA definition of anti-Semitism was adopted in 2016 by consensus at the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance which is the world's only intergovernmental body that deals specifically with these issues um, with more than 30 member countries, including Canada. It's a non-legally binding working definition intended as an educational tool or a guide to help advance understanding of contemporary experiences of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is a constantly mutating virus that infects all parts of society. Um, it, not, no ideology or political vantage point is immune. Um, and while many people, their frame of reference for anti-Semitism um, is the Holocaust, it's unfortunately very much alive and well today. It is not a relic of the past, nor is it exclusive to Nazi ideology. And so it's very important that we have a definition that helps to bring together some of the many different facets of anti-Semitism that's being experienced today by Jews around the world. Whether that's happening in, real, in the real world, or I can't even say the real world because the online space is part of our real world, whether it's happening in physical space or in online space, I guess. Um, the definition includes a number of examples that subject to context can help illuminate anti-Semitism for folks. It's really a, a first step in um, coming to understand what anti-Semitism looks like. Uh, and of course, that first step is key. Uh, you have to recognize it before you can address it. It's been uh, adopted internationally, nationally, and here in Ontario provincially uh, as a consensus-based tool that can really help folks understand the Jewish experience today when it comes to anti-Semitism. Um, and again, whether that's online or in person. But it's not a simple checklist that you can program into an AI uh, algorithm and uh, just let it loose and it will expunge all anti-Semitism from the online space. Uh, anti-Semitism is more complex than that and the definition is quite nuanced accordingly. And the examples provided are a starting point. They're dependent on context. They're not a comprehensive catch-all for every manifestation of anti-Semitism that's out there. Add to that the sheer volume of anti-Semitism that exists and is circulating online. It means you need an automated solution to track it. It's, it's sort of beyond human capability to uh, deal with it alone at this point. And I know some of the social media providers are, are working on solutions here, but, but nobody has been able to crack that code, so to speak. Um, and, and also the insidious ways in which anti-Semitism continues to disguise itself or, or reiterate, mutate into new forms also poses a challenge. Um, social media platforms are also organic. No one, no one, well, I shouldn't say no one, but most of these providers, they don't set up their platforms uh, intending for it to become a, a platform for hate, an incubator for anti-Semitism. Um, this seeps in and can take over and can insinuate itself in very damaging ways. And uh, it's difficult, as, as Emily mentioned, the sheer number of different platforms, how they pop up, um, uh, constantly new platforms uh, can make it very difficult. Um, and of course, a definition is not a, a silver bullet answer to any of this. It's really a starting point to orient, a point of orientation around all of these things where the real value is in education. And I think um, we all have a responsibility, uh, whatever is gonna be expected of government or of social media platforms and online uh, platforms moving forward to deal with these issues, um, education is a core component. We all need to become uh, literate about the traps that are out there. We need to be savvy uh, about where online hate 
is manifesting, how to identify it. And when it comes to identifying anti-Semitism, um, the IRA definition is, is the, the world's consensus-based uh, most prolific definition and, and most useful tool in this regard. Thank you, Noah. Cer certainly a, a wonderful tool to be used. And I think that we still need to be, we're still learning on, on the best ways to use it in, in institutions. And so, Emily, I'd like to, to move on and ask you, um, what are some of the challenges that institutions of learning face in creating safe spaces for all? And what are some of the best ways for institutions to advance safety in light of anti-Semitism um, and other forms of hate? Um, well, I think to the to the first part of the question about challenges institutions face in creating these safe spaces, I think the concept of something called a safe space uh, for all is something more and more organizations in this field are really moving away from because it's simply an unrealistic expectation. I think uh, institutions need to recognize and understand that we can never truly have safe spaces to talk about these difficult topics, anti-Semitism, racism, and the, the many issues that plague our societies. So instead, what I think we need to see is institutions creating space for conversations that have robust community guidelines in place that give people the opportunity to share their opinion and be respected uh, without necessarily having this kind of misnomer of it being safe for everyone. I think uh, utilizing uh, individuals who are skilled dialogue facilitators are, is a valuable tool that institutions can use to make sure that these conversations happen respectfully. In terms of how we can kind of advance building these safe, safer spaces, um, I think uh, the greatest issue that we have is that institutions need to be proactive rather than reactive. So they need to be thinking about how these issues impact their organization or institution long before there's an incident that evidences that. So put a plan in place already to advance these tolerance, values of tolerance and respect for all rather than kind of assuming that's the case until you're proven otherwise. Uh, our Canadian office, the Friends of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, we've done so much work uh, particularly over the last two years uh, with school districts, with school boards, parents, educators, and students. But this is often happening in the wake of an incident. So like Noah said, a video promoting uh, anti-Semitism goes viral, students perform it at school, and then there's a reaction to that. Of course, programming in the aftermath of something like that is critical to reset those boundaries and build understanding for the future. But we kind of always wish that some of these efforts were taken uh, further in advance before we get to that situation that requires that intervention. So what, what are some success stories? Well, I think uh, teacher training done uh, at the Friends of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, but other places too, uh, offering an introduction to kind of an equity framework for classrooms uh, is really important in, in building that baseline for what's appropriate in that space and making sure that individuals from every, every background feel uh, respected. Uh, in terms of anti-Semitism, obviously the introduction of content pertaining to the Holocaust is, is vital, but as Noah said, anti-Semitism does not begin and end with the Holocaust and the Nazis. Um, so instead offering broader programming, maybe that offers uh, understanding of some of the symbols that we see used and how they manifest today is important. And also using uh, testimony to understand the human impact behind these. It's also critical in kind of uh, corporate spaces too that these conversations are happening. Uh, we've often heard that anti-Semitism is unfortunately left out of many kind of diversity and equity conversations. And so uh, the Simon Wiesenthal Center has created a new program in that corporate space to educate about that too. Uh, I think also uh, institutions need to make sure that these experiences are kind of necessary rather than optional. Uh, encouraging space for individuals to build critical thinking skills and active listening skills are kind of two basic start points that anyone could engage with. And there are certainly many organizations out there doing this work already that can be reached out to and lent on. You don't have to reinvent the wheel and come up with your own phenomenal idea. Uh, you can rely on those in this space that are already doing this work. We have mobile uh, museum buses, we have a physical museum in Los Angeles. Uh, so there's plenty of scope for people to interact with this content. Uh, folks just have to make the effort to go out and find it. Those are all really, um, really amazing points, Emily. Um, I think, you know, a lot of those can be 
we're thinking, we're, you know, thinking about those, you know, in the, in a university setting or how we can apply them, I think is just, is wonderful. Really, really great, insightful things. Um, so Daniel, um, how can we create more awareness around anti-Semitism online within our own networks? And what role, this is kind of the part two, what role do tech giants play in this conversation? Uh, so I think uh, Emily makes a lot of uh, very strong points about the need for education about the multifaceted nature of anti-Semitism, how, of course, it's not just denial, there's many different aspects, and that the way the different aspects of anti-Semitism anti manifest in specific communities or subcultures is different and requires specific solutions. Uh, for that, uh, I think we should look to Germany as an example, um, who are really leading the way in developing innovative approaches towards subcultures and other approaches where anti-Semitism may be um, generating. So this could be the online gaming lobby, the mixed martial arts gym, the uh, alternative music scene. The German federal government provided, provides enormous amounts of funding for nonprofits and various groups that basically have uh, not only early stage intervention, but culture building programs, trying to create environments in which it's very clear that anti-Semitism exists and is unacceptable. Um, so that's one thing I think we can do for awareness. It has to be very targeted with communities. Uh, regarding what tech giants can do, I think the participation of tech giants is essential, but doing the right thing in this regard is a really hard sell for them. So at the start of the program, we talked about how about 84% of anti-Semitic content is not taken off of um, a large social media uh, website, which is true and a very troubling fact. But we should also emphasize that the World, World Jewish Congress a few years ago found that every 83 seconds, something anti-Semitic is posted on social media. And that's only what they detected. So much of anti-Semitism is shrouded in codes, references, memes, whatnot, that the rate is actually likely much higher. So you need people um, who are able to address what they're looking at. Uh, Noah mentioned that we need uh, automated approaches because uh, the bulk is simply too much for human beings to um, address. And I think that is a very strong point. However, we should also uh, recognize that when, say, um, social media content or social media sites got serious about taking down Holocaust denial content, they actually ended up just taking down a lot of Holocaust education content because their uh, detection software wasn't strong enough to detect what it is they were actually looking at. Further, I've even uh, experienced seeing Facebook comment threads full of Holocaust denial references that I've reported and then don't get taken down because they're coded. They're saying things like um, wooden doors or no chimneys, little references to very specific Holocaust now claims, which are um, declarations of anti-Semitism, but which pass by. So how we can get computers to detect that, I don't know. But the flip side of that is that if we're gonna have people doing it, it's both extremely, it's extremely expensive and to a degree ineffective. One, we need people who know what they're looking at and that requires expert knowledge. And two, those people need comprehensive mental supports. Uh, reporting by The Verge in 2019 found that a number of individuals who work for Facebook specifically, who are content moderators, are paid minimum wage, they have very little support, and their job is to make split-second decisions on things like 9-11 trutherism, Holocaust denial, all sorts of ugly things. And unfortunately, they were both spiraling with mental health problems, and some of them were actually starting to fall for the conspiracies that they were supposed to be detecting themselves, uh, which raises, basically, circling around to the large point of, okay, like we need substantial moderation that's led by experts and that's incredibly expensive and it runs against the profit models of social media companies. Uh, with so like none of us pay to use social media for the most part. And because of that, the product is us. Our data is what the product is. And so th these websites are best inc are incentivized to have us keep clicking. And what keeps people clicking, unfortunately, is anger generating content. That more than any other content, any like nice videos of grandmas or whatnot, does not get the types of comments, reshares, uh, retweets that something really ugly and hateful will get. And so they have to eat into their kind of profit incentive in two different ways. And getting a private company to do that is incredibly difficult. Definitely a difficult problem to, um, to tackle. Hard to know where to even start. Um, Noah, maybe, you know, maybe this can help answer the question a little bit. How, how can leaders of Canadian organizations increase awareness and education about anti-Semitism within the broader public? Well, I think um, 
the starting point uh, for leaders is to lead by example. And, uh, you know, beyond our time together today to, to, to take some time to learn more about uh, their Jewish colleagues, their experiences, and to encourage others within their organizations to do so as well. Um, you know, we can, we can, we can uh, focus our efforts and try to boil the ocean of, of uh, the entire public, but I think if everybody uh, focuses in, the, uh, in their own uh, sphere, so to speak, uh, we can actually have have uh, significant impact. Um, you know, panels like this are good vehicles for advancing this kind of learning. So thank you to Toronto Metropolitan for for showing leadership in, in convening this conversation today. Um, and and it's really important in embarking on these kinds of opportunities to listen to representative voices and not to tokenize the Jewish community in ways that may be convenient but don't get the impact uh, that that's necessary. Uh, I think it's it's a really good practice to facilitate and empower Jewish affinity groups within organizational ecosystems um, and to ensure that anti-Semitism is included in the organization's uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, um, and that the experience of anti-Jewish racism is not erased from the broader approach to anti-racism in general. And I, I'll, I should note um, on this panel in particular that our, our, our lead sponsor, TD, has taken some really important steps forward on both of those items uh, recently, and, and I've been very impressed with the work uh, that uh, that the folks at Shalom TD have done uh, over the last uh, number of months. I think it's it's crucial, and it's been said by, by the other panelists as well, that when a Jewish person calls out anti-Semitism, believe them and support them. All too often the response is to minimize the experience or to question uh, their sincerity, which is in and of itself an example of anti-Semitism. This can come from a well-meaning place. It can be uncomfortable to come face to face with something so unpleasant and ugly. But if we sweep hate under the rug, it'll continue to fester. And if we turn a blind eye, it'll continue to grow. And if we don't nip hate in the bud, it grows like a weed and we may find ourselves unable to uproot it, whether that's just within an organization or within our society. So if there's one thing that people can key in on as leaders, it's to listen when somebody brings forward a concern about anti-Semitism, to take it seriously and to address it, no matter how small it may seem, it can turn into something much bigger, much more toxic. Uh, and it's, it's always better to deal with these things up front. With regard to online uh, anti-Semitism, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of internal chat uh, functions within uh, large corporations um, have uh, manifestations of anti-Semitism seeping in there. Uh, but I think, you know, as a general principle, we need to improve our literacy as a society with regard to online hate and online spaces. And, and um, that's something that we all have a role to play in, in pushing for greater education. Uh, it's something that we've called on the government to, to uh, support and resource. Uh, having that sort of basic literacy about online hate, about uh, online anti-Semitism and other forms of, of, uh, of hate and prejudice that are prevailing right now. Um, because no matter uh, the, the approaches of the tech giants or of government regulation or of some of the phenomenal programs that, that Daniel described taking place in Germany, ultimately users have a responsibility to uh, know the environment within which they're operating and to navigate it uh, in an educated way. And, and uh, that's something that, that leaders can help to facilitate uh, within their, their own spheres and, and beyond. No, I really like what you said about, um, you know, validating, um, you know, when, when somebody comes and says that they're, that they've experienced anti-Semitism and, and just, um, it takes a lot of bravery, right? Not a lot of these things go unreported. So I know that, you know, when we work with students on campus, like it takes a lot of bravery to stand up and say that something happened to them in a class or somewhere else. And so just just the, just being heard is, is really the first step and it, and it really means a lot um, when they know that, you know, their experience has been validated by the university. So I really appreciate you saying that. Um, we are going to move on to, um, and the audience questions actually. So thank you uh, to, to everyone uh, for answering your specific questions. Um, so we have a, 
about 10 minutes or 10 to 12 minutes to go through um, some questions. There were quite a few. I don't think we'll get through all, but um, I'll ask a few. Um, so this question, this first part is for Noah and Dan, and then the second part's for Emily. So Statistics Canada data says that over the last several years, the Jewish community has been the most frequently targeted religious minority in Canada. And for Noah and Dan, how do you view the situation for Jewish Canadians today? And for Emily, um, we'd actually love to hear um, this, how you view the situation uh, for Jewish Americans, because we know it can be very different. So Noah and Dan, would you like to start and then Emily, and um, we'll see how many questions we can get through. I should, thanks, thanks for the question, Elise and Dan. I'll I'll, I'll jump in. Um, uh, this is it's not just the last several years. I uh, I remember um, putting together a report back in I think the the early two thousands, referring to two thousand two Statistics Canada data, uh, uh, reflecting the same thing. And as uh, hate crime in general across our country has increased over time. There's been an upward trend gradually over the last two decades. Uh, um, Anti-Semitic hate crime has consistently been uh, at the top. I think anti-Black and anti-Jewish hate crimes uh, have consistently been the most frequent manifestations of hate in this country over the last two decades. Um, what's interesting uh, is the stability of that. There are years where other forms of hate will will peak, and 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 uh, they'll have peaks and valleys. The curve when it comes to anti-Semitism has been very very constant, uh, increasing and and uh, demonstrating a clear trend. What does that mean? Uh, Canada is one of the greatest places in the world to live as a Jewish person. Um, so, you know, I don't want these statistics to paint any picture different than that. Um, but I think one of the challenges that we have with such consistent uh, levels of hate that are consistently increasing over time here is that um, it sort of fades into background noise. Um, yes, there's always, every year, the Jewish community is the most frequent religious minority when it comes to hate crime, um, if not the most frequent target of hate crime writ large. Uh, that ceases to be news uh, over the course of 20 years. And I think that's, that's where, uh, you know, our community, um, I think is most troubled is we feel the increase, we feel the rise, it's present in our lives. So is the vibrant uh, Jewish life that we enjoy here in Canada. I don't want people to think that we're defined by anti-Semitism here, but we feel this increase, we feel this rise, and um, it's, it's not clear that society recognizes it as well, just because it has been so constant. And so, uh, panels like this are really important uh, to help bring this uh, experience out into public view. Um, and, and I think that uh, it's part of our job as an advocacy organization to make sure that governments are, are understanding sort of what this experience is and are, are taking action to address uh, some of these concerning trends uh, that we're, we're seeing uh, represented in the statistics. Uh, but more worrisome in the experiences of families uh, in communities, uh, not just numbers on a page. Uh, I suppose in addressing that question, uh, I acknowledge Noah made a lot of excellent points. Um, although I work for the United Jewish Appeal, I'm not Jewish myself, so I don't want to imply in any way that I'm speaking for the community, and my perspective is from an external uh, place. Uh, obviously, we've seen hate crimes against Jews um, just really escalate in recent years. As Noah had mentioned, they've been just steadily going up and up in recent years, despite Jews being a quite small population in Toronto and in Canada. Uh, we don't need to look any further than what happened at the yeshiva in Toronto last week, where an individual threatened um, a number of people with death with a weapon over what sounded like an interpersonal uh, dispute um, that escalated so quickly. So it's something like that, and how I've heard many anecdotes of individuals about how they're scared to wear visual uh, signifiers of their Jewishness in public. They're scared to wear a kippah in public transit, a t-shirt, a necklace, whatnot, because they think it might result in some sort of attack. Really tells me that 
there's problems with uh, the state of Canadian multiculturalism. Because on the one hand, we say, like, okay, we have a society where everyone can be who they are. Yet a number of people are saying that we don't feel safe being who we are. And the date uh, of crimes is bearing that out. So that to me shows that there's a real problem for Jewish Canadians. While at the same time, I also want to underscore the great resilience and the beauty of the culture and community of the Jewish of Jewish Canadians in the face of all this. And the fact that, as Noah mentioned, they're not defined by that hate. Um, to, to add from the uh, American perspective, uh, full disclaimer, I am neither American nor Jewish. However, uh, I've spent a good deal of uh, years here now. I'm, I'm working for the Wiesenthal Center. My, my best baseline for understanding this is uh, FBI hate crime statistics, which uh, are notoriously uh, not necessarily the most reliable of, of tools, but they do show us kind of broad trends in, in hate crime states. And unfortunately, what I hear from Noah is very much what we see in the United States, that year on year, American Jews are, are the number one target of religious motivated hate crimes. Uh, the most recent data from 2020 shows that 50%, 57% of the religious motivated crimes target, targeted Jewish people. Uh, and this is despite the fact that Jewish people in the US make up less than 2% of the, the population. Um, I think one uh, maybe slight point of, of difference and maybe a warning to our Canadian friends is, is that the last three years we have had this plethora of deadly attacks against the Jewish community in the United States, uh, targeting not only just obvious locations like synagogues, uh, Noah mentioned in, in January the, the hostage situation in Texas, uh, but also in, in Poway and Pittsburgh. But these attacks can also occur against Jewish people sitting out in Los Angeles eating dinner that are being targeted by anti-Israeli rhetoric, uh, Jewish people who are just shopping at a kosher market in New Jersey. Uh, folks attending a Hanukkah celebration at the home of a rabbi in New York. These are kind of softer targets that unfortunately uh, provide no safety either. Uh, I know at our own, my own organization, we regularly have active shooter drills and practice lockdowns because of this inherent threat constantly posed by being Jewish or being affiliated with a Jewish organization. So to me, it feels uh, that Jews uh, in America, like Jews in Canada, are facing this unprecedented assault on their identity by perpetrators from a huge variety of backgrounds. There's no one particular type of perpetrator creating this environment, and that these attacks can occur pretty much anywhere a Jewish person could be found. Thank you so much to all three of you. Um, we probably have time for just maybe two more questions. So. Um, Emily and Noah, the, this is for you. Um, the question is, what can students do to fight anti-Semitism on campus? And um, it wasn't indicated if it was, you know, just the Jewish community or not. So it, it would be wonderful to hear from you. Um, you know, what can what can the Jewish community do on campus? What can you know allies and then the broader, you know, Jewish the, the broader student population? Um, what can what can everybody do towards fighting anti-Semitism on campus? Well, it's I, as, as I think I, it's been I've been the longest removed from being a university student. So maybe I'll speak first so that Emily can correct everything that I, I get wrong in this regard. Um, uh, I think uh, the most important thing that I would I would say is to lean into student life. Um, don't retreat because of concerns about anti-Semitism. Lean into student life. Um, engage with other people from other communities. Engage with people involved in student leadership. Uh, lean into student life. Go talk to Elise. Uh, Hillel is here to support you. Um, don't don't fade away. Lean into student life. Um. I would add to that. Um, I think one of the things that we need to prioritize for students who choose to engage in this battle against anti-Semitism is this self-care component, right? That you should uh, make sure that you're looking after yourself first and foremost. Uh, and so I think one thing that uh, could be prioritized is creating safe community spaces for Jewish students to come together to talk about the challenges that they face without necessarily the kind of scrutiny of, of other folks who maybe aren't going through that same struggle. Uh, I think offering opportunities for other students to learn about anti-Semitism and contemporary manifestations is critical if we're going to build cultures 
where this understanding uh, is, is bolstered by the knowledge of how it's operating today, whether it's an educational forum, documentary screenings, talks. Um, I think like Noah said, also potentially partnering with other affinity groups on campus to initiate these cross-cultural partnerships is vital. Uh, and giving students, I think, the opportunity, rather than assuming that um, this uh, anti-Semitism comes from a, an inherent uh, negative bias, is maybe uh, giving them the opportunity to better understand Jewish culture, what it means to be Jewish, in order to dispel some of those stereotypes and propaganda. And I think certainly uh, for students who aren't Jewish that want to pursue battling anti-Semitism very much like myself, um, I think that this is something that we shouldn't leave the struggle uh, solely to the group uh, that the hate is being perpetrated against. I think that's a grave disservice to our collective humanity. And so I think um, hopefully we could encourage more groups to take on this battle uh, as something that's worthwhile for the whole community, uh, not just to support you know, one, one perspective. Um, those are wonderful answers. Thank you both. And two, two very different perspectives and, and very insightful. And that was just, um, that was really wonderful. Well, we're, I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question. Um, if you could just keep the response to maybe like one or two minutes, that would be wonderful. So this question is for Noah and for Dan. So could you please speak quickly about the tension between protecting against hate speech and personal acts of violence and the need to protect freedom of expression? As, as, as short as you could. Um, uh, Dan, maybe we'll start with you and then Noah. Sure. Uh, so I'll comment on that by saying that we often frame protection of minority rights and free speech as separate uh, questions. But I think we should reframe the subject itself, where in we should consider whether people feel safe um, expressing their own opinions, whether the laws protect them or not. So um, suppressing hate speech itself actually promotes free speech because more people from vulnerable communities will feel safe and protected in expressing their own true thoughts on sensitive issues. Um, so there's my answer. I'll just add that um... None of our freedoms are absolute, they come with responsibilities. And so we have freedom of expression, but it doesn't go all the way into promoting hate against uh, other people. Uh, and the Supreme Court of Canada has, has uh, jurisprudence on this in terms of what the threshold is for criminal hate promotion. Uh, the, the standard is high in order to protect that freedom of expression, but there are limits. And I think that is something that is, uh, reasonable in a free and democratic society and, and the Supreme Court agrees. And so I think that that's a, a that's that's a very clear line that's been drawn that we can orient around. Thank you both. So we're going to um, just wrap up now with some final thoughts. Um, I'd like to end by forecasting the future and to all the panelists. Could you please give our audience one call to action that they can implement to address anti-Semitism online um, in their personal and or their professional lives? Um, and then we'll just go in the order, Daniel, Emily, and then Noah. Uh, a single call to action. Uh, one thing that people can do is educate themselves about the um, the, how plausible deniability is at the heart of online hate, not just anti-Semitism, but other bigotries, and to try and keep up to date with internet culture. What is happening? Because anything that we're seeing happening with online culture, you're absolutely seeing manifestations in online hate. So basically to stay on the ball, you have to keep in line with what the kids are up to. And unfortunately, that's a pretty tricky thing to do. Um, I'm gonna say two. Uh... <laughs> We, I think uh, first and foremost, reporting anti-Semitism and incidents of hate when you see them online is critical, whether you're reporting it to the platform or sending it uh, to us at the Wiesendahl Center, I report at wiesendahl.com. Uh, it's critical that we hold the tech giants accountable for the content that's on their platforms, whether it's uh, allowed or violating the community uh, guidelines there. And we work closely with them to try and help shape that policy. Um, I think you may not see that immediate action 
um, and response being taken. It may be not the most rewarding of um, processes reporting online, but I think it, it does make critical change. And I highlight one example from a group of fifth graders in Canada who found a game online and sent it to me. And then I was able to contact the makers of the game to engage in a dialogue with them about why it was problematic. So if fifth graders can do this, then I think uh, it's something that we can all take on as a responsibility. And the second piece is to support the organizations who are already doing this work. Again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So whether it's financial, whether it's volunteering, whether it's amplifying messages online, help spread the work that so many amazing organizations are already doing that is going to make lasting change, but we need all the help we can get. Uh, education and reporting, both key pillars. Uh, I'll, I'll add one additional element. Right now, the government of Canada is drafting online hate legislation to try to use the levers of government to address some of the problems that we're seeing. Now is an opportunity for everyone uh, here to reach out to their local MP and talk about uh, why this should be a priority and the urgency of taking action to address online hate. Reach out to your, your elected representative. Thank you, um, Daniel, Emily, and Noah for being part of this panel today. Um, you know, the Jewish community and, and you know, beyond, um, we're all incredibly grateful for the work that you do. And um, definitely, I personally learned a lot from all three of you today, and it was, it was really an honor um, having this hour with you today, and um, and yeah, I was it was just wonderful. And I'd like to also thank um, our lead sponsor of the Generous Future Panel Series, the TD Bank Group. Your leadership is truly commendable. And thank you as well to our promotional partners, the Association of Fundraising Professionals, Greater Toronto Chapter, the Canadian Association of Gift Planners, Canada Helps, Imagine Canada, and Community Foundations of Canada. And of course, our audience, thank you all so much for joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedules to discuss this very, very important topic. Please expect an email in your inbox in the coming days with the link to a recording of this discussion. And please feel free to share it widely with your networks. And we hope that you will join us on June 13th for Generous Futures Supporting Refugee Resettlement. Details about this webinar will accompany the email that you receive in your inbox. So on behalf of myself at Hillel and um, the university, we thank you so much again for joining us. Please take care, everybody, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon.